In today's lesson, we're going to look at cell division. The first aim is explain the importance of cell division, then compare the process of mitosis and meiosis, and then finally explain the changes within the cell during division. I thought I'd start by introducing you to another unsung heroine in the scientific world. This rather ghostly looking image is of a lady called Henrietta Lacks, who unintentionally became a martyr for biology. In 1951, she died of cervical cancer, and unknown to her, her doctor removed a sample of cervical cancer cells. These cells were cultured, that means grown, and preserved. These cells, which we refer to as healer cells, Henrietta Lacks, have been used to develop our understanding of cancer and cell division as a process. After all, cancer is simply uncontrollable cell division. Even today, her cells continue to divide and we still use them for research. You may have heard of chemotherapy. This is one weapon we have against cancer. Chemotherapy involves taking chemicals into the body, and these chemicals stop the process of cell division. Now, even normal body cells divide. But because cancerous cells divide at an accelerated rate, the drugs usually prioritise these cells first. You see, cell division involves the replication of our genetic material in the form of chromosomes. At the base of every chromosome, you'll find an extended region called a telomere. Every time a chromosome replicates itself, the telomere shortens a bit like a fuse on a stick of dynamite. After a specific number of divisions, usually around 50 in humans, the telomeres become so short that the cell destroys itself. This limit on how much a cell can divide is called the Hayflick limit. Different organisms have different Hayflick limits. For example, mice have a Hayflick limit of about 15 divisions, whereas the giant tortoises found on the Galapagos Islands have a Hayflick limit of around 110 divisions. There seems to be a correlation between the number of times a cell can divide and the organism's lifespan. This is why tortoises live longer than we do. And therefore you might jump to the conclusion that having no Hayflick limit would mean you'd live forever, this would be a good thing. But when you consider that cancer is an example of a cell that has no Hayflick limit, you can see how it sometimes isn't such a good thing. There is, however, one species of jellyfish that does not have a Hayflick limit. In other words, it is immortal. It cannot die unless it's eaten. Every time the cells mature, they revert back to an adolescent state. So the concept of a Hayflick limit, while not needed for your exams, I do feel is quite interesting. So there are two types of cell division. One is called mitosis and the other one is meiosis. Mitosis involves a division of the cell that results in an exact copy, a clone, being produced. This is a picture of a human karyotype. You see, in every nucleus inside every cell in your body, you will find 23 pairs of chromosomes. 46 in total. 23 of these you get from your mother and the other 23 you get from your father. A karyotype is a way of simply putting them in size order. The 23rd pair differs depending on whether you're a female or a male. You can see the Y chromosome here is shorter than the X chromosome. So when a cell divides by mitosis, we are literally replicating each one of these pairs, we call them homologous pairs, and packaging them into a new cell's nucleus. So mitosis occurs in somatic cells. Those are normal standard body cells found everywhere in your body. We need mitosis for growth and repair. For example, you can see that this arm has been cut pretty badly. And what will happen is cells will divide to replace damaged old ones and will get repair of damaged tissue. So mitosis is essential for enabling us to grow and heal. To help students remember mitosis, I usually tell them about the time I broke my toe, and over the next week or so I watched it heal through the process of mitosis. So remember, a healing toe for mitosis. However, mitosis isn't just used for growth and repair. Some organisms use it as a form of reproduction, a form of asexual reproduction to be precise. This is when all the genes come from one parent to make a clone, an identical copy. So the cells will be diploid, di means two, and ploid refers to the number of sets of chromosomes. So we have two sets of chromosomes, one, two, one, two, etc. And we give that a value of two n, and the cells will be identical. So here you can see a bacteria dividing by mitosis. It's a process known as binary fission to produce an exact copy, a clone of itself. Meiosis is another form of cell division, and here we produce four genetically unique cells. So you can see all the cells will be different or varied. Unlike mitosis, meiosis only occurs in one area of the body, the reproductive organs, the testes in males and ovaries in females. 
Meiosis only has one function to produce gametes, sperm and egg cells, sex cells. So here's a sperm, here's an egg. These cells will be haploid. They will contain half the number of chromosomes that a normal somatic or body cell contains. And this is really important because during fertilization, where the sperm will fuse with the egg, then the nucleus of the sperm enters the egg and fuses with the nucleus of the egg cell to produce a diploid cell. That is a cell with a nucleus containing 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs, in other words, back to 2n. If gametes or sex cells didn't have half the number of normal chromosomes, then every cell would end up with too many chromosomes. The biggest gamete that you're probably familiar with is a normal chicken's egg. This is just an unfertilized egg cell. The cell is actually the yolk. The other really important thing about meiosis is it produces four unique cells. They're genetically different. This is why your brothers and sisters look different to you. So to help you remember meiosis, just think of sisters. And remember to ask yourself, why do sisters look different? Well, that's because they're created from genetically unique gametes. In other words, the sperm and egg that made them up were genetically different, which is why they physically look genetically different. So think meiosis creates different looking sisters, cis and cis. And that explains the importance of cell division. So now we're just going to compare the two processes. Every single exam question I've seen on meiosis and mitosis is about what you'll see in this table. If you're pushed for time, I would keep your learning to just what's on this table, not worry too much about what follows. A typical exam question would be compare the process of mitosis and meiosis, or describe two differences between meiosis and mitosis, and the question would be worth anything between three to six marks. It's incredibly easy to get these marks, just pay attention to the following points. So in mitosis, two daughter cells are produced from one parent cell. So this is the parent cell which will divide to produce two daughter cells. We call them daughter cells because another cell gives rise to them. Also be aware, this does not mean that three cells in total are made, just one cell was split to produce two cells. During meiosis, four daughter cells are produced from one parent cell. So you can see here are the daughter cells being produced. Now these could be egg cells or sperm cells, but never a mix of the two. It depends on whether these cells are being made inside a male or female's body, obviously. Secondly, in mitosis, the cells that are created are genetically identical. That means the cells produced, the daughter cells, contain exactly the same number of chromosomes with exactly the same genes on them. In other words, no variation between the cells. In meiosis, the cells that are created are genetically unique, in other words, varied. So you can see that I've drawn them in different colours here to represent the fact that they're not exactly the same as each other. In mitosis, the cells produced are diploid, that means they contain two sets of chromosomes, 46 or 23 pairs, whereas in meiosis, the cells are haploid, they contain half the number of chromosomes. So not 23 pairs in each cell, just 23 chromosomes. Mitosis involves one division of the parent cell, whereas meiosis involves two divisions, which you can see here, one division to produce two cells, then another division to produce four cells. And finally, as I've said already, mitosis is used for growth and repair and also as a form of asexual reproduction by certain organisms such as yeast and bacteria, whereas meiosis is used explicitly for the production of gametes, sex cells. So in a question you literally just need to compare the differences. So you would structure your sentences as follows. In mitosis, two daughter cells are produced, whereas in meiosis, four daughter cells are produced. In mitosis, the cells are genetically identical, whereas in meiosis, they are genetically unique. In mitosis, the cells are diploid, whereas in meiosis, they are haploid. Mitosis involves one division, whereas meiosis involves two divisions, and so on. And if you're really skilled, you could probably do it in one sentence. For example, mitosis produces two genetically identical diploid daughter cells, whereas meiosis produces four genetically unique haploid gametes. Although that is one sentence, it's loaded with marking points. And that is how you compare the process of mitosis and meiosis. Now this bit is for those of you who like things in full detail. However, I should say that I've never seen an exam question to test people on this level of detail. There are four key stages to any cell division. The first phase is called prophase, and think of pro, P, for prepare, because what the cell does is it prepares itself for division. So here we have a cell and its nucleus, and two key things occur during prophase. Firstly, the nuclear envelope, that's the membrane that surrounds the nucleus, starts to disintegrate. 
Secondly, for the first time, chromosomes become visible under a microscope. They become shorter and fatter, something we call condensing. And also, they take on this X-like appearance. You see, normally a chromosome just looks like that. But before cell division, it creates a copy which is attached at this hinge-like joint called a centromere. So these are actually identical chromosomes, but in this formation we call them sister chromatids. So the nuclear envelope breaks down completely and allows the chromosomes in their condensed state to basically free flow around the internal environment of the cell. Now normally there'd be 46 of these, but obviously that's quite difficult to draw and quite confusing to observe. So I'm just going to demonstrate this with two homologous pairs. The blue chromosomes have been inherited from your father and the yellow ones from your mother. You will also see some other structures called centrioles. These will start to migrate to the poles of the cell and they'll start to produce a spindle, a bit like a spider does, a bit like a web. These are thin protein filaments which are essential for cell division. In fact, some drugs that wish to see cell division will stop the spindle formation. The chromosomes will then start to line up in the center of the cell. This indicates the next phase called metaphase and you can remember meta for meat because the chromosomes meet in the middle of the cell. In mitosis they line up in a single file. You can see the spindle fibers have attached to the centromere of the chromosomes, that central point. The next phase is called anaphase. This is when the spindle fibers start to contract pulling apart the sister chromatids like so. The cytoplasm also starts to pinch inwards. In the last phase, telophase, T for terminal, final phase, the cytoplasm divides completely to form two new cells. These daughter cells will be diploid. That means they'll contain 46 chromosomes. Each diploid cell is given the value of 2n for two sets of chromosomes. The mother's chromosomes being one set, the father's being the other set, two in total. So in mitosis, we start off with prophase, where the nuclear envelope disintegrates and the chromosomes condense. Then we have metaphase, where the chromosomes line up in the middle and the spindle fibers attach to their centromeres, the central point of the chromosomes. Then during anaphase, the sister chromatids move apart from each other and the cytoplasm starts to divide. And then finally, in telophase, the cells separate completely and the nuclear envelope reforms around the chromosomes. In meiosis, cell division starts in much the same way, but this time we call it prophase one, not just prophase. Here, the nuclear envelope disintegrates and the chromosomes condense. In metaphase, however, the chromosomes do not line up single file, but rather line up in their homologous pairs. So chromosome 1 from your mother will line up with chromosome 1 from your father, and chromosome 2 from your father will line up with chromosome 2 from your mother. It doesn't necessarily mean that all mothers' chromosomes line up on one side and fathers on the other. They're randomly shuffled, and this again adds as a source of variation because you don't know whose chromosomes will be packaged into a specific gamete. In anaphase 1, entire chromosomes are pulled towards the poles of the cell. And once again, the cytoplasm starts to divide. Remember, in mitosis, the sister chromatids were pulled to either side of the cell, not the entire X-like chromosome. In telophase 1, the cytoplasm divides completely, and the nuclear envelope reforms around the chromosomes. At this point, we still have 2n in every cell. We don't have half the amount of genetic material. This is why we have to go through this cycle again. So in prophase 2, the nuclear envelope disintegrates. In metaphase 2, the chromosomes line up in the center of the cell, but this time in a single file, not in their homologous pairs, because they no longer have their homologous pairs. In anaphase 2, the sister chromatids are pulled towards the poles of the cell. In telophase 2, each cell divides to produce four genetically unique haploid gametes. In other words, four daughter cells are produced. Each of them are gametes, sex cells, let's say egg cells in this case, and they contain half the amount of genetic material. In other words, 23 chromosomes, not 23 pairs. So when you compare them next to each other, you can see the differences become more apparent. Start off in the same way, but here in metaphase, they line up single file mitosis, double file in meiosis. In anaphase one, the sister chromatids move to either pole, but the entire chromosome moves to either pole in meiosis. Telophase is where mitosis ends, but telophase one is just the end of one cycle in meiosis. Then meiosis sort of copies what mitosis does. The chromosomes line up in single file during metaphase two. 
then each cell will divide to produce four genetically unique gametes. And that's how you explain the changes within the cell during division.